Hey everybody, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar. Today is the Kindship Investor webinar. My name is Robin Holt and I'm here from Virtual and I am gonna be today's host effectively breaking down all the really, really fun aspects of Kindship and its traction and its future that we're gonna really learn a lot more about today. Just so you know today's format, we are gonna be running through a quick presentation that will give some insights into the business its kind of its mission, how it's built up so far, and the upcoming investment opportunity for that. And then we're going to use the rest of the time, which will hopefully be roughly 40 minutes, uh, for a Q&A session. So I'd really love to invite everybody to use the Q&A box as much as they possibly can um, to ask questions as and when they pop into your head, because we're going to be picking them up in order once the presentation is complete. Before we go over to the presentation, I'd love to hand over to the Kindship team to quickly introduce themselves. So starting from the top, Steph, I'll start with you. Awesome. So hi, everyone. I'm Steph. So I'm one of the co-founders and I'm also head of community at Kindship. Uh, I'm a mum of two. My youngest daughter, Charlie, is autistic, um, but my role really is at the heart of the organisation. So our people, I'm really passionate about working with our people. Um, I work with the team to make sure the user experience is always getting better. And I work with our volunteers to make sure they're really super supported and thriving in our organisation. Yeah, that's me. Fantastic. Who wants to go next? Summer, you're uh, not muted, <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to you. Happy to jump in. Hi, everybody. I'm Summer and I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of Kindship. My um, relationship to our mission is a little bit different. So I am actually have a diagnosis of autism. That's where our family sits. Um, and yeah, as a CEO, I look over, um, I guess, everything <laughs> um, and support our amazing team. And um, yeah, I'm sure many of you have probably heard from me in emails and text messages by now. Fantastic. Tara? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tara. So I'm head of marketing and one of the co-founders here as well. I'm a mum of three and my middle child, Willow, has a diagnosis of cerebral palsy and autism. So I'm super passionate about everything we have to offer and the community has to offer because we all have lived experience and I know how important kind sheep is to families just like me. Awesome. And Andreas. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, uh, my name is Andreas and I'm the CTO. So my, my job is to ensure that we provide the best possible user experience to our families when they join the app. Awesome. And I'll be handing over to the Kindship team to run through their presentation. Thank you, Robin. I'll just share the screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah, okay. Um, so as Robin said, thank you all so much for jumping on. We're really excited to tell you more about Kindship, um, our business, where we've come from, what our mission is, and obviously answer all of your investment related questions. So I'm going to try and keep this as short and sweet as possible because I'm sure um, there's a lot of questions um, waiting for us. So to kick things off, um, I need to know how to Okay, here we go. Why Kindship Matters. So we know that parents raising children with disabilities in Australia are two and a half times more likely to have low well-being than the average Australian adult. We actually did a survey of 1,000 of our parents recently, and I think that number is probably a little bit conservative. Um, you know, we had really high rates of depression and anxiety and job loss and isolation. So um, there is obviously a need in this community for more support. We also found from that survey that 41.2% of our parents were unable to maintain paid employment, mostly because of the high care needs of their child and also because of, um, I would say, an inflexible working environment. And also 50.8% um, of our parent community reported that they experienced financial hardship. We found from that survey, on top of that, that parents are spending about an average of four hours a week just trying to navigate the, S, uh, the NDIS, and that doesn't take into account all of the other care support work that they do um, for, for their little ones or big ones living with disabilities. So we have a founding principle here at Kindship, which is that 
When parents are informed, they are empowered. And when parents are empowered, they can change the world. I've had the good fortune of talking to some of you who may be part of the webinar today. And I know we do have quite a lot of interest from people who are parents. Um, Thank you. Um, so I thought I'd actually hand this over to, to Tara, maybe just to speak to, um, you know, your experience as parents and how this statement relates to, you know, you as a family in terms of feeling more empowered and, and, and also what you're seeing um, from the community as, as we work with them. Yeah. Um, so I always, I always think I wish Kindship was around back when we were navigating the early diagnosis days. Um, I remember instantly, like we got the cerebral palsy diagnosis. I actually knew knew it was something that was on the cards, but I um I was shocked and I was just isolated, absolutely isolated. And I had I wanted to do everything for her, and I had no idea where to start. Um, so along the way, I have really learned that community is everything. Like we actually went overseas for an operation for my daughter, which absolutely changed her life, and. I only knew about that through the community that I'd connected with. So um, just getting advice and support from parents around you has just been everything for our family. So I'm so passionate about um, just being part of Kindship and being able to give that to families and especially when they are navigating those early days to let them know that there is this support out there and there's a whole community right there um, waiting to help you and guide you along the way yeah amazing and I mean I'm very similar to that in that for us I remember there was a penny dropping moment where we took Charlie to gymnastics and she hid underneath the trampoline and she was only very very little at the time it was still pre-diagnosis but I just remember thinking my my baby's different like something's happening something's going on and she just we were going to have like this is a long haul thing our life is not going to go in the direction that I had envisioned and at that point it was very scary because it's this big like I remember looking around everyone connecting and having their cups of coffee and their kids like eating out of their lunch boxes and listening to their parents for the most part and I just felt like so displaced and um I looked at her and I'm like she needs more than this as well she deserves like to feel like she belongs as well so um and that feeling of isolation I realized later that it's it wasn't just me there's like thousands and thousands and thousands if not millions of parents everywhere that are experiencing this loneliness and we are there to bridge that gap um, and, you know, by supporting the community in my role at Kindship, like we, we see it every single day. Um, but when parents know that there are other parents like them there, um, it can absolutely change the trajectory ahead of them. Thank you both for sharing. Um, so I know that there's been a couple of questions around what kindship is, and I think this is a great chance to explain that a little bit further. So kindship currently is a free social networking app for parents raising children with disabilities, delays, and neurodiversity. We, we built this app because we really wanted to provide parents with a safe, private, and fundamentally kind space to be able to connect with other mums and dads who understand what it means to raise a child who, you know, beats, um, to the, you know, dances to the beat of their own drum. So Kindship currently has a couple of different features. We like to say we took the very best bits of what would be a platonic Tinder, um, Facebook and Clubhouse. So parents can jump on there um, and experience our match and chat feature, which um, connects them with parents who are matched by diagnose, diagnosis, age group and location. And if there's a mutual connection, they then have the opportunity to have a private chat that can turn into a group chat. And we also have local group chats as well. So for example, all of the parents in the North Adelaide area will be invited into one group where they can share information that's very much localized and also from there establish meetups where they you know go and have a local uh, coffee at the local coffee shop we also have our community feed and that's really about empowering parents to be able to ask questions and share knowledge so what you would expect of a Facebook feed that we're looking at how we can optimize that by topic of interest so for example the idea is if a parent 
Um, maybe he's asking a question about how to toilet train a child with Down syndrome. That's something that they can very easily find in terms of that information rather than having to, you know, scroll through an entire um, feed. And then the middle um, image that you can see there is our audio rooms. So these are like... I guess you could think of them as like live Zoom calls, but without video. So parents can jump on there um, and have a chat. We have some themed ones. We also have just, you know, a copy and chat. Um, some parents love to get on there and, and have a voice and other parents like to sit and just listen. We have a dedicated dad's club that happens um, every Tuesday, I think, guys. And it's very popular. It goes for hours. So um, we have really tried to, to create a safe space for dads on this app as well. And then the last image that you see there is our plan management tool, the Kindship Wallet. So the Kindship Wallet will actually sit within the community ecosystem that is Kindship. And we'll talk a little bit why, um, about why that's so important in a minute, but that's, so yeah. So the wallet and the social networking app will be one um, experience for our parents. And I think the powerful part of that is that the community will be a, a funnel in a way, you know, for, for new parents, uh, uh, plan management customers, but the, the plan management tool will also be a funnel for the community so they feed each other. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit about our traction. Uh, the Kindship app launched at the beginning of this year and at that time we had about 100 parents using um, the app actively on a, a monthly basis. We now have over 2,000 parents um, using the app on, uh, very actively on a monthly basis and more than I think 90 volunteers now. Um, so I should mention that that growth has been achieved predominantly by word of mouth and a little bit of PR. Um, we really wanted to test what the, the uptake of, of this app was going to be before we started rolling out any kind of paid marketing. So um, that's really only happened in the last kind of three weeks. So in terms of our, our growth potential, I think that's really exciting. And our volunteers, we call them kind folks. So these are parents who um, nominate themselves to help us with things like moderation. They also run local meetups, um, in-app events, um, and they form part of our uh, co-design team as well. So they really are the heart of our organization. At the moment, parents are spending about an hour per week on the app. Um, our 10-week retention is sitting at about 51.71%. Um, and as you will have know, will know if you've read some of our documentation, we when we came up with the idea of the Kindship Wallet, we really wanted to present it to our community first to understand if this was something that they were excited about before we told the world, the world about it. Um, so when we did that, we had 82% of the parents that we that we spoke to about it um, sign, say, sign me up to the wait list. You sold, like, you sold me on the spot. So um, there is a huge excitement in terms of, of what this wallet will mean for our community. Um, and also from a social aspect, we have currently 21 and a half thousand social media followers and a Facebook group with over 4,000 parents on it as well. And those are growing very nicely thanks to Tara's efforts on the social front. Um, we did want to talk as well about how we're measuring and talking about the, I guess, the opportunity of kindship, because I'm aware some of you might not be so familiar with the NDIS space. And I'm sorry that this is sitting very unfortunately over the top of my text. Um, but I'm assuming that's something to say 265,000, almost 266,000 children um, in Australia currently have an, an active NDIS plan. So those are children under the age of 18 is, is how we've, we've classified them. Um, so every single NDIS participant is entitled to a plan management budget. This budget sits on top of what they get for their NDIS funding. Um, it's separate, it's purely just for them to be able to engage a plan management provider. And that amount is the $1,248 per year. So that's how we came up with that $332 million opportunity. We times the amount of kids currently um, with an active NDIS plan with, with that um, purchasing power of, of, of plan management. Um, this is something that we're seeing growing in the last two years. I think it was about 15% um, growth in terms of the uptake of plan management. And I think it's also important to mention that um, in terms of the NDIS, they're seeing like 
as you would expect, large numbers of younger children coming onto the scheme as they're getting diagnosed. We're seeing the same in terms of who's coming onto the app. Um, so that's where we've really decided to focus initially our customer sort of target base on, on parents that have children under the age of 18. So when we talk about our technology, I think it's important to spend a little bit of time talking about where we see the disruption happening in terms of um, the plan management space. So as some, of, as some of you may be aware, plan management at its core is essentially like bookkeeping. They're responsible for helping parents to manage budgets and pay invoices and have an overview of sort of where their NDIS um, plan is tracking and, and, and what to be aware of as, you know, that ticks over into a, a new year. Um, we feel like we can do all of that very well, but also add on top of that an experience that will really empower families to understand how they can make the most of their NDIS funding. Uh, it's important to note here that we are not competing in terms of a price point. The NDIS sets that budget in terms of plan management support, what we're really doing is competing on, on experience. Um, and that's where we really see an opportunity to capture a very large percentage of the market. So um, I'm gonna try and do this as succinctly as I can, but you can imagine if our plan management tool sits within the Kindship community ecosystem where there is such a rich amount of insight being shared by our parent community, we have the opportunity to use technology to actually capture that in a way that funnels it through to parents in a very accessible and digestible way. Um, to give you a practical example of that, the status quo in the market at the moment is that if a parent is looking, for example, for a speech pathologist in their local area, their plan manager may be able to pr provide them with an A to Z listing of all of the speech pathologists that currently exist. Um, that doesn't necessarily take into account whether those speech pathologists are currently operating, if they're taking new clients, what their wait list times are. What we're looking at through Kindship is because we have such an enormous pool of people living in you know, those local areas um, of creating like a Google, a Google Maps experience where, for example, parents would be able to say, see what are other families saying about their experience with that local provider, what did their wait list time look like, um, you know, and potentially other options that they haven't necessarily considered. Um, we're also looking at how we can pull information from things like invoices, which we'll be, you know, transacting um, to be able to understand. So, for example, if you had a child that was 10 with autism um, and your budget uh, your, your reviews coming up and perhaps you haven't spent all of your allocated amount, we might be able to suggest ideas based on what other families are spending that funding on. So maybe you haven't considered equine therapy, but we know that there are, you know, 10 other parents with children of a similar age and a similar diagnosis getting a lot of benefit out of that um, and actually helping to connect you with those families so that you can have a conversation with them and understand if that might be something that's useful for your family. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, a better idea about what we're talking about when we, we say we're marrying the power of AI technology with community. Something else to mention here is in terms of organizational efficiency, it means that because we are operating within a community environment, a lot of the time spent, we understand within a plan management business is answering a lot of the same Q and A's. So um, we see, uh, it's an assumption, but we, we, we're quite confident of the fact that we'll be able to leverage um, just parents who are part of our community who are very willing to share their experience and support other families. They'll be able to answer a lot of those questions. Um, not, not that we won't be there to support, but, you know, that we'll be able to, to offload some of that, that Q&A load, um, which brings me to who is going to be providing the support. And I think that's where a lot of our team get really excited, um, you know, from those stats that I mentioned in the beginning that our parent community find it very difficult to find work that accommodates their child's care needs and their family circumstances. Um, and that there's that, that history of financial disadvantage, but we also know that lived experience is just enormously valuable 
for our parent community and what it would mean for our parents to be able to pick up the phone to ask a support question and talk to somebody who has walked in their shoes or at least has you know an understanding of what it means to be a parent navigating the NDIS so that's where we've really committed to making sure that we're employing parents as plan managers and and making that working opportunity you know as flexible and accommodating as it needs to be so that they can continue to look after their children as well. Hi. So <laughs> that's going to play. I thought it would be nice to include um, as we sort of wrap up this part of the presentation, a video that is sent to all of the new users that join the Kindship app. So um, you'll see obviously our lovely co-founders uh, there, but I think it, it does give a sense of you know, the people and the community and the passion behind this project. So it's only a minute, um, hopefully you enjoy it. Timeship started with a passion for parent advocacy and a dream to change the world. We couldn't find a safe space of our own where parents like you and me could ask questions, share the beautiful and the hard moments and also our advice. So we built it. And we will continue to build it. With your support and feedback, Kindship will become home to your cheer squad, mentors and friends. A space where you, I and we can be unapologetically ourselves and be surrounded by people who just... This brings me to what Kindship is not. Kindship is not a dating app. Nope. And we will not tolerate any behaviour that makes you feel uncomfortable or unsafe. The team and I are here to help. If you get a little lost, need pointing in the right direction, have any questions or want to get more involved in the kindship, please reach out. That's a little bit of kindship for you. Um, maybe a good opportunity to mention here. So kindship um, is a word that we made up and it, um, it we like to say it takes the very best, best bits of kindness, friendship and kinship and merges them all in a one big happy um, family. So that's really where we as, as a founding team are coming from and, and what we're really trying to drive in terms of our culture and the experience that parents have on our platform. So that brings me to the invitation for you. Um, we're so happy that you're here and we're so excited to, to talk to you more about this opportunity. Um, we would love to welcome you as shareholders in our company. Obviously, you know, we're looking at how we can make this, um, you know, as meaningful the opportunity for you both in terms of what that means um, for your bank account, but also what it means for, for the world. So um, we would love to see as many of you as possible um, jump in when we open our offer campaign on Tuesday. If you haven't already expressed um, your interest in, in investing in Kindship, please jump on and do that today because that way you'll make sure, we'll make sure that you are across all of our documentation that will come out on the day and, and, you'll, and you'll be notified about when that offer campaign um, goes live. I also wanted to mention that we have a special investor welcome pack um, that we're going to be handing out to our first 300 investors. So there's a little incentive for you um, to be the first one to jump in on the day. So very happy to hand it back to Robin and um, start answering some of your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. That's, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I love the messaging and the mission around this business and, and really have done since the beginning. And I think your messaging is super clear. And I mean, you've clearly uh, tapped into a, a market there, especially considering how your word of mouth has just really grown your user base from such an early stage. And I think that that really just goes to show that you've, you're, you're really finding your market fit um, before you've even got a, a big user base, which is really quite something. Um, we've had a great question in here already, actually, which is around the kind of way in which you'll be allowing other plan managers to, to, to subscribe to the app or software for a fee. So thereby sort of retaining their own participants while adding an additional income stream. Is that something that you might potentially look at as a business in the future? Um, so we as a company need to make sure that we maintain our impartiality as any NDIS service provider knows it's very important that we don't look like as an organization that we're promoting any one 
provider. So in that sense, if somebody is investing in clientship, they are investing in, in, in the opportunity of us as a plan manager and us as a community and a movement, um, mm -hmm. not necessarily, in, and, well, I should say not an integration of their business. With clientship, that's purely so that we can, can sort of cover ourselves in terms of that red tape. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so hopefully that answers the question. If, if, if there are plan managers that are interested in investing, you know, we know that there are a lot of amazing plan managers out there. Um, it's, you know, I think it would be a case of them having that business, understanding that that's, a, that's an income stream for them, but also investing in kindship as, as, as a technology company that's really looking at how we can disrupt the NDIS almost from the inside out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Zane, please um, do ask another question in there if you'd like to know a little bit more about that uh, in, in any more detail. Um, you had another question in here, which was kind of in relation to the um, the actual $332 million figure. And I'm just pulling mm -hmm. it up now. So Collins asked if they, so they are projected figures for which year? I don't believe that they're projected figures. I'd love, maybe you could just provide a little bit more clarity on on, on those statements that you are making around the market size. Sure. So that $332 million would be if every single child under the age of 18 who has an active NDIS plan was to say to the NDIS, I want to have access to that budget to be able to engage a, an NDIS plan manager. That is essentially the annual spending power of that opportunity. Um, it's not a projection on our part in terms of our revenue. It's, it's, it's the targeted market pool that we're we're aiming to tap into and Collins just added that the num the participant numbers were projected effectively so that's actually um current data off the NDIS website in terms of the current number of 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 children under the age, age of 18 with an NDIS plan and that's where I was talking about that that number is growing as more children are diagnosed Got it, got it, fantastic. There's some great questions coming in here, so I'm really pleased to see uh, everybody using the Q&A box and uh, we'll, we'll absolutely get into the details here. So Steve had asked, what do you need in order to be certified by the NDIS as a virtual plan manager? Um, are there in, um, in, impendents, uh, impediments that, uh, to that certification that you're aware of? So every NDIS, provider needs to go through an NDIS provider registration process. Um, we are in, in currently in that, in that stage. We're expecting it to be done in the next month or so. Um, and that includes, you know, a company audit and, um, you know, making sure that, you know, all of our staff have to working with children's checks and that sort of thing. Um, but as I said, that's something that anybody who wants to offer an NDIS service needs to go through. It's not plan management specific um, we in the plan management world need to have somebody on our team who has um, a financial background so we have a chartered accountant um, working with us so that ticks that box but otherwise there is nothing that would would stop us from it being able to roll this out yeah fantastic fantastic um, and a question here which is uh, great to to see come through is what is the overall amount expected to be raised for this project so in this equity grappling round um, and we were just talking about this one this morning so I'll hand this over to you. Uh, so we are still um, as you can imagine learning as more interest comes in um, for this equity crowdfunding campaign what would be reasonable to expect of a raise we um, based on our projections have have seen that if we can raise between one and a half million and two million that that would mean that we could be self-sustainable so we wouldn't actually need to fundraise again so that's um, what we're looking at but uh, I think come Tuesday we'll, we'll, we'll you know that information will be there in our um, offer campaign as to what number we actually pick. <laughs> exactly the, the minimum and maximum target which is required in a CSF campaign um, is uh, or, or CSF offer I should say uh, is, um, is stated that there's a minimum target and a maximum target so that will be available in the offer document when the campaign launches on Tuesday but you will have to express interest to invest to, to receive early access to the investment offer on Tuesday and, and also by the way we will be sending out the link if there's as anybody here who hasn't expressed interest to invest already I'll send it over so you can go ahead and do that. 
Um, Megan here has asked exactly what will investors' money be spent on? Great question. Um, perhaps, Andreas, I can hand that question over to you. I feel like I've done a lot of the talking. <laughs> sure. So, um, I, I mean, first and foremost, of course, we want to um, accelerate the uh, launch and scale of the Kindship Wallet. So that's that's uh, that's the uh, uh, that's 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 basically the top top priority. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've been also testing um, paid uh, acquisition channels. We are seeing that an average uh, cost per app install fluctuates between five and six dollars. So we would love to see that uh, ramp uh, ramp up our user growth as well. So it's really us um, transitioning from you know, a social network to an NDS service provider essentially is, you know, what, what, what the funds will be allocated towards. And as Summer says, um, depending on our uh, kind of our race, um, you know, we would love to see this to be, uh, we would love to see this to be our, you know, last ra- round that gets us to self-sustainability and um, that, that cash flow from, uh, will kind of fuel our growth from there. We know that uh, with the, um, NDS plan management comes also with uh, with a setup fee. We'll we'll specify that in the in the offer document. And uh, yeah, the beauty of that, like the setup fee, I believe is above two hundred dollars, where the cost of customer acquisition is uh, or cost per app install currently is between five and six. So there's a lot of room for us to acquire customers at scale. So that's where our focus is going to go: is to make sure the tech is ready, make sure we as an organization are ready to provide an incredible service, and um, yeah, we're ready to grow from that point onwards. I should just clarify that that setup fee that Andreas is talking about is also paid for by the NDIS. It's not um, a, a fee that the parents would need to pay. It, it sits on top of that $1,248 annual subscription amount that um, uh, is available for um, engaging a, a plan management provider. So, yes, hopefully that answered your question. It will be a combination of, of tech um, and also um, staff and also all of the things that would be required to attract, a, you know, a larger customer base, including things like marketing. Yeah, awesome. awesome. And Violet here, thanks for, for your question. She's asked, will you have marketing opportunities for investors? Is that in terms of job opportunities or is, uh, yeah, perhaps we could answer that one, but Violet, please do ask, um, yeah, for a, a little bit more clarification. I'm curious if Violet, is a, if, if Violet is a service provider. Um, if so, uh, there we made a decision very early on with Kindship as it is a social network, not to have it as an advertising space. We, you know, there's been lots of studies done that have shown that Facebook is actually a very negative experience for a lot of people purely from the fact that it's its business model exists to show you ads. Mm. Um, so, and also we, we know from our parent community, almost from the day of diagnosis or even before when they're thinking that something may be a bit different about their child, they're, 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 they're taken from this place of being the parent and the expert in their, in their child's life and suddenly sort of at the mercy of a team of therapists and doctors and people who, who know a lot more and, and, and better. Um, so we really wanted Kindship to be a space that celebrated parents as being experts in their children um, and having that valued lived experience. So for that reason, we decided not to have plan- uh, sorry, any kind of service provider on the app. Obviously, if you are a speech therapist and you have a child with a disability, that's a different story. You're welcome as a parent. Um, but we don't have any kind of advertisement when it comes to services. I would say if you're interested from that perspective in kindship, the best thing to do would be to tell your community about it as a social network, because obviously the more of your customers that are on the app who have had a great experience of talking about that, that's genuine and that's something that we support. Awesome, awesome. Steve, thanks very much for your question. Can you talk more about how you're thinking of using AI to power your plan management tools? Are you meaning referrals or rankings of providers or report options or something else? Andreas, perhaps that's a question for you. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, first and foremost, we need to we need to acknowledge that uh, we can't uh, group um, all our entire community in a, with a label that you know their parents are children with disabilities. An experience of being a parent of a child with Down syndrome is very different than being a ch- uh, parent of a child that's uh, that is autistic. 
So personalization is really at the heart of, of, of the experience that we're trying to create here. Um, and um, so um, I am in that sense a little bit hesitant to show, uh, to show, to kind of reveal all the ins and outs uh, of, of exactly what we're going to do. I think that's, that's also part of our competitive advantage. But like at this particular point, um, there's a lot of data already that exists within our community mm. that can be used to empower parents um, uh, kind of NDAS plan management journey. So um, we, we're going to be utilizing that. And essentially what we're doing on top of that is we're adding an additional layer of that with um, invoice information. And as you can imagine, within an invoice, there's a lot of information, right? When a parent starts a particular therapy, what type of therapy are they doing, right? How often are they doing, right? So I'm really excited about the, the impact of that as well, right? So for example, you know, what's the impact of, um, of a hydrotherapy Mm. of hydrotherapy for a child with cerebral palsy that kind of information is is, is just not available to us so um yeah and, and and literally next to me here on the left side we have the adelaide's um university's uh department for machine learning and ai and we're very embedded in the uh in the kind of essays uh startup ecosystem so we're looking forward to working also with the academic institutions uh to help us uh um, you know, d d define the model that would achieve that personalization required to have the best possible experience for parents when they join the app. I think it's worth noting as well, on top of that AI capacity, there's also a cybersecurity focus for Kindship as well. Um, we know that there is a lot of space to improve that sort of online experience in terms of safety and privacy for our parents. So we have an amazing team of um, advisors that we're, we're working with to make sure that that kindship ultimately is as safe and private. And obviously we know that we're dealing with a community of people who are vulnerable and also with, with information that's you know sensitive too. So we're, we're very mindful of that and are working hard to make sure that that is as secure as possible. Of course, of course. And even going back to the, the topic that we were talking about previously, Nathan here has asked to sort of clarify if there's no conflict of interest for service providers to invest, um, so i.e. speech path providers. Um, that's a great question. So I think it's, it's important to cover both ends. From our end, there isn't an, a, a conflict of interest for, for you to invest in us because, as I mentioned, your investment is separate from any kind of commitment to advertisement, which we need to, as I said, maintain impartiality. On your end, um, I would definitely say this is something that um, if you have concerns about to seek your own legal advice, we've spoken to our lawyer and they've said it would be best practice that if you were referring somebody to Kindship, the plan management tool, not necessarily the social network is in itself a free app and, and a bit different, but obviously they're the one product. So um, that you would, it, it would be best practice for you to um, make them aware that you had a, a state, like a shareholding in the company, just so that, you know, it's transparent. Yeah. Um, but that would be the only thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, a question really specifically about the platform itself. How closely will the discussion forums be monitored on the app to particularly around sort of false and dangerous health information, spam and bullying, et cetera? We get this question a lot, which I think says a lot about perhaps some of our competitors. Um, so closely, we have taken an approach of combining, which we like to do, as you'll have figured out by now, um, technology and the power of people. So we have features within the app that make it very easy for somebody to block and report, for an example, another user or something that they see. Um, we also have an incredible team of parent volunteers who operate as moderators. So so um, they are very on top of making sure that if things aren't appropriate, that they are removed very quickly. But I think we have also taken a stance on kindship um, where we didn't want to overly control the conversation. We wanted to come from a place of kind, kindness and empathy and understanding that this is, you know, we're talking about adults um, and that, you know, conversations can happen where perhaps there are different points of view and that we can find you know, a middle ground. That's not, it's not a perfect world. That doesn't happen all the time. And we obviously deal with that in that situation. But um, yeah, I would say that's, that's our approach at, at today. Yeah, I can Steph, Steph, would you like to say something about that, about the moderation and working with volunteers for to keep the community 
sure. culture protected? I mean, I think some are kind of covered everything, but our team of guardians are just so amazing. I have to give them so much praise. They are so incredible. Honestly, these guys work around the clock to make sure that it's this super safe space. They're constantly in consultation with each other, with our team. And I suppose my role is really supporting them, um, you know, to, to make those decisions in a way that they feel really empowered. So it's really important to us that kindship is forever a really safe space. It's, it's a priority. So, yeah. We also have Amanda on our team who isn't here today, but she um, helps Steph look after our volunteers, but she's also certified um, in terms of online well-being. That's another really important part of kindship. So we have um, systems in place to support parents who maybe need to be referred on to services that provide more um, emergency crisis support because that's obviously not something that we can do as a platform um, and Amanda is very generous with her time and we'll, we'll spend a lot of it actually giving parents a call and just making sure that if there was something flagged of concern perhaps in a comment or question that you know that we've at least started that conversation with them and can assess the situation and go from there. Yeah awesome awesome. Okay. Um, your, your comment here is just great um, from Corinne, who's basically said, uh, thank you very much for defining the kindship word. I love that you were able to create a new word and what a beautiful reflection of your aims and values. No question, just appreciation. Oh, That's very, very nice. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, Violet here has asked, will you be NDIS registered and has your projection been calculated on plan managed or self-managed or, or, or and NDIA managed? Um, yes, yeah, so we will. Yes, manage maybe. Yeah. Um, so to be a plan management operator, we need to be registered as an NDIS provider. So yes, um, as I mentioned, we're in the final stages of that process. Now we expect it sort of in the next month or so. Um, and in the meantime, we're working behind the scenes with our parent community to understand what the wallet needs to be, so that we can, you know, get get moving as as soon as that certification comes in. Um, in terms of the projections, I'm not quite sure what we're talking about because we haven't talked, we haven't, we have to be quite careful and then perhaps Robin can um, give a little bit more context to this about what we say in a future sense. ASIC has some pretty strict rules about us um, saying anything that's not based on really solid factual information and as an early stage startup company we you know we don't have that basis of years and years and years of um, generating revenue and that sort of thing so maybe Robin you can you can summarize oh, I mean you're nailing it so well Summer I, I think I mean you've pretty much finished it off for me and the next question is very much so in tune with that because um We've had a question around what percentage of the $300 million plus market will you capture? Uh, and of course, this is you know something that you've worked out from your calculations of the industry, um, really just by looking at the numbers, looking at the uh, actual funds available to any, um, any single sort of parent with a, a disabled child and, and then sort of identified exactly what, what um, kindship could facilitate as, as an opportunity. But in terms of looking at this, this has to be super aspirational because, of course, you're an early stage startup and, and really kind of reflecting where the business is at, at this point in time. Um, we just have to be transparent about what the business has achieved so far, as opposed to what the business hopes to do in the future, because, of course, it's, it's great to be able to make these calculations and say, well, we'd love to have 10% of this market or, or, or more of this market. But of course, the, the absolute best way of doing that is by really focusing on your path and really focusing on, ser on serving the people who are using the app. And that's exactly what you're doing. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that question in a bit more detail, but um, uh, I'll, I'll throw over to you to give the opportunity to do so. I suppose in an aspirational lens, um, well, I mean, factually, you know, we, we are able to say that when we presented this opportunity to our community, we had 82% of our parents say, sign me up, I want to use this service. They were a combination of parents who are currently being plan managed by another provider who are currently self-managing and was like, look, mm. You know, I may or may not like my self-management experience, but I would actually, I would choose to use you as my plan manager because, you know, of our social impact opportunity and what and what we're aiming to do in terms of that experience. Um, from an aspirational lens, 
you know, as I said, we aren't competing in terms of dollar value. What we're competing on is experience. And I think mm-hmm. there, the, the reality is there isn't another plan management company that operates within a community ecosystem like ours. I know there are other ones with Facebook groups and separate kind of things happening, but nothing where the two are so interlinked. And I think that's where we see so much power in terms of being able to capture that community-driven insight and information. So, um, you know, we're really looking at how we can be a market leader in this space and and through that actually, as I said, change the experience of families with the NGIS from the inside out. Because when we can start sharing, for example, with the government, what wait list times look like that's not that's not data that they've been able to capture so i think we see as a as a technology company and you will be investing in a technology company an opportunity for some incredible disruption and innovation um i also think it's important to note that whilst our focus is on that under 18 market there is nothing that's to stop us from saying look we've smashed this it's incredible that you know we, we like this experience is, is, is amazing. We want to make this available to adult participants and having a separate standalone app that would make that possible. So we could expand that, that, that market reach as well. It's just, we feel that it's important to have a focus to start with. That's a really good point. And I think that the question which I'm going to jump down to now is actually the best segue into where you are and what you're looking to achieve because Megan here has asked, how many customers does Kindship need to break even? Um, what what would you like to achieve as a as a predicted client base for year one or year two? Um, Andreas, would you like I think to? The break even point is that yeah, the particularly interesting one here. Interesting one, yes, Andreas. Yeah, I was looking at the at those sort of. Yeah. No, I would I would definitely just based on the feedback we've got, Robin, from you this morning, would be a little bit hesitant <laughs> to make any projections, but. Yeah. Um, Look, uh, uh, the, the you know the, the the assumption the assumption so it's a purely an assumption is that we'll need thousand paying customers to be fully self sustainable and cash flow will fuel our growth, mm. and with that would come you know probably at least four to five new parent uh, parent employment opportunities that um, that that will come with that as well. So ultimately, like a thousand customers, you know, there's there's this I don't know if you've ever heard of that. There's this thousand fan rule which you say like if you have a thousand fans they will basically take care of you moving forward it's it it, it a thousand true according fans. To our, yeah yeah Very exactly much so it, it looks like according based on our, uh, the input that we've got from um from our um kind of C- 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 virtual cfo uh, we've been guided that 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 rule probably are going to apply to us very strongly moving forward so we're seeing that as the kind of aim yeah. um uh, post race think- I should mention we we are already getting um, parents writing to us saying how can I sign up to be one of your plan managers. So we have we have a healthy, um, yeah, group of people who are really looking forward to working um, in that capacity as well for us. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, you've got a couple of comments here. Really, just an appreciation. Guy here is a great presentation. Congrats on the initiative. Very impressed. Thank you so much, Guy. Um, Zane here has said, thank you very much for answering my question. I see great potential to leverage the technology into a sector where there are essentially four big plan managers, none of whom have great software. Uh, I'm sure that you're you're across this already. Um, And Rob has asked, where do you register interest for more information? That's on the virtual website, on the Kindship page, um, where you can go ahead and express interest to invest. Since you're here, since you've registered for this webinar, I'll be sending you an email with a link where you can express interest to invest and then receive more information when the investment offer opens next week. Um, Nathan here has asked, I did stated, did miss this part of the webinar. So sorry if I missed this. Is the plan management aspect automated or are there people who uh, process the invoices? Um, so we will be using a combination, Andreas, jump in, but I understand a combination of AI to, for efficiency, but also there will be, um, you know, a team of accountants and, and people supporting that that um, processing element of, you know, the bookkeeping element of, of uh, our plan management tool. Um, there is also a support element to providing plan management services. Part of the remit is to actually help on, um, families understand how to spend that funding. Um, and that's where we're looking at a combination of, um, you know, phone call opportunities, online chats, and also leveraging our community to be able to help answer some of that, 
support related question as well. Um, and that's where we see our parents, unless we have somebody who, you know, is obsessed with numbers and that's where they want to, to sit in terms of that administrative role. We see our parents actually fulfilling more of just that um, support line um, role. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. And we've had a question here, which I'll um, answer for the for the first part. What are the expected returns for investors in time frame, frame for returns? So um, with investing into any private company uh, through equity crowdfunding, it's really important to state that this investment is not a liquid investment. So you're not necessarily investing into a company that the, you can then sell your shares um, in a month or two's time. Um, effectively, like the, the exit opportunities for any investor um, in an early stage startup are quite limited. And really the time frame is, is very, uh, it's very di difficult to predict because of the fact that you're investing into a private company, um, proprietary limited company, essentially. So look, you know, the company would absolutely consider, but we would not limit itself to dividends, uh, trade sale, um, uh, share buyback or, or an IPO potentially in the future. Putting any timeline on that is really not necessarily the right thing to do um, because of the fact that the company is essentially raising funds right now to go on and, and, and grow. And so all the funds being used in this capital raise will be used to, to grow the business itself. And so in terms of any kind of expected returns for investors in a time frame, uh, I always have to uh, just in, in, in you know, make sure that every investor knows that they need to uh, read the offer document, read the CSF risk warning, and just be aware of the fact that you should be investing funds that you don't need to access in the next couple of years. Um, so really just, just making sure that you're, you're not parting away with your life savings uh, if, if you need those funds to, to essentially live. But um, I would love to hand over to the Kantship team to add anything else to that. Oh, I mean, I think you did an excellent job, Robin, but I did like the analogy of it of it being sort of like planting an avocado tree. You know, it's something yeah, that yeah. Um, we plant today together or on Tuesday together. And at some point, you know, we, we, we aim to, to have it bear fruit. And obviously our team will be working as hard as we possibly can to make sure that that happens in as speedy and, you know, as maximised mm -hmm. way as possible. Um, as you heard, we are all people with, lived experience of disability um but this is also what our life you know bread and butter is so we we want this to be as successful um in terms of its um monetary opportunity as well as its its impact yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um and you've you've had a question here which you've already touched on, which is actually great. And this is really interesting feedback. Kathy here has asked, why is it only targeted at NDIS participants under 18? I work with young adults with autism and this app would benefit their families as well. I'm sure you've heard this before. So yes, um, it is a little bit confusing. So I should say the social networking aspect of Kindship, which is that free platform where parents can jump on and share knowledge and you know build friendships and find community, that is in no way restricted to an age group, not even a diagnosis. We have parents on our platform who, you know, may never get a diagnosis for their child or who are in the process of getting a diagnosis for their child. It's 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 hugely broad. We also have, we're um, making space for um, people who are primary caregivers, you know, maybe grandparents who are doing the bulk of the caring. We want to make sure that this is an accessible community mm -hmm. for them as well. Um, in terms of the plan management tool, we're not going to be like tapping anybody on the wrist and saying your child is over the age of 18 and therefore like we're not offering this service to you. It's more that our um, focus in terms of the marketing and that sort of thing that we do to capture our customer base will be geared toward parents who have a children within that age group and that's that's because we see as I said the, the importance of focus but also looking at who are using the app we do have a lot of parents you know that, that have adult children but the vast majority are parents who um, sit within that zero to 18 age group so it just makes sense for us to focus on them at the moment because they're going to be very much involved in the co-design of this product and telling us what they need it to be. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great, fantastic. Um, Vita here has said, I find half the battle with our plan managers is getting a real person on the phone when I call. Will Kindship provide this phone support or will it all be online? 
yes, so there will be phone support available and you will be talking to a parent who maybe doesn't have a child with the same diagnosis, but who will at least understand what it means to be on that end of the spectrum navigating the NDIS. Yeah, great. And Rob here has asked a question, what um, plans do you have to extend your client integration beyond 10 weeks? Uh, sorry, can we repeat that one? Uh, so, Rob, please do um, yeah, just provide a little bit more clarity on this one. Um, so Rob has asked, what plans do you have to extend your client integration beyond 10 weeks? Perhaps maybe there's a particular um, point that you were making earlier um, around the business itself. Retention maybe is what he's addressing. So obviously as a company, we're working very hard from a technology standpoint, mm -hmm. but also as a community engagement standpoint to make sure that that is um, you know, as lengthy as possible. We are finding, you know, in the early days of clientship, we sort of said, like, we'd love to be looking at weekly active users. And then we realized that we kind of set ourselves up to fail because the reality is, and I'm sure Steph and Tara will nod their heads at this, you know, some weeks there's hospital visits and therapy appointments and you just don't even like sleep, let alone touch your phone. So it actually made more sense for us to focus on yeah. um, more of like a, a monthly um, active activity period, um, which is respective of the fact that parents, their family life is going to get in the way. And also, you know, there are parents who will use the app because they're experiencing a point of crisis or then really needing that level of support. And then things, you know, are swimming and, and they and they, they disappear for a little while and then they come back. So we're learning as we go, as we said, we only really launched this product at the beginning of the year, how to measure and then optimize for retention and engagement. I hope that answers your question, Rob, please write if I've completely missed yeah, them. That's, that's great. Um, and Zane here has asked, well, made a statement and then asked a question. Um, there are limitations to the utility of choice to participants in rural and regional locations. In many cases, their provider options are severely limited um, and would not need an app to tell them who the providers are. Has um, the numbers of these participants been, been considered um, in your analysis? And is there something planned to draw these participants into the software? Um, so, yes, I mean, we know that the vast majority of, of participants do live in more metropolitan areas. You know, we're not making promises around um, having the entire 100% market share. So there may be participants who, you know, and we know that the clientship is not necessarily going um, to be for everyone. I think yeah. there are still opportunities, you know, we've seen in the event of COVID, telehealth has taken off. So I think there are, are more options for families in terms of providers that are out there. And perhaps that's where we have an opportunity to educate and work with those families who are in rural environments, what might be available to them that they don't necessarily know about. As Tara mentioned, um, her daughter, you know, um, had the opportunity to go through a, a surgery that her medical team in Australia was saying, crazy, don't do it, you know, and it was only through talking to a parent community that was like, you have to at least have this conversation with surgeons over in the in, the, in another country um, that, that they, they went through that process. And Willow is now, as I understand, Tara, you know, able to, to use her body in ways that, that was just not predicted from her Australian team. Um, so I think it's, it, it would be, premature for us to say that we don't have anything to offer the, those rural and remote communities. Mm, a really interesting point, really interesting point. And Rob provided a bit more clarity on um, the statement he made earlier, saying that one of your stats was the retention, uh, uh, was that the retention was 51% at 10 weeks. So this might be with you as a base. Um, yeah, so I think I answered that one in terms yeah. of us. Um, exactly. Exactly. Great, fantastic. And um, we've had, so another question here, a big part of your service is the recommendations from other parents, but um, HPRA, which I'm sure you call APRA, uh, does not allow testimonials. How will you get around this? Um, well, I don't think they allow testimonials on, on an individual health professional level. Yeah. Um, someone maybe you can comment on that. So, it will be a fine line to walk and obviously we'll be learning as we go. Um, there is nothing to stop as far as I'm aware a conversation happening between two individuals where in the privacy of that conversation, they ask more questions about their experience with the provider and perhaps, you know, the, the name of the person providing that care. It's not, it won't be something that's advertised on clientship, the, the individual provider 
um, recommendation or, or, or review, but I think uh, that's, that, that's where being a social network, there's lots of different ways that we can leverage the power of community to help inform that decision-making. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just being conscious of time, by the way, we have hit the end of the webinar itself. We've got a few more questions that I'd really love to get through so we can provide as much value here as possible. Um, we are recording the session, so if you do need to jump off, um, we will send you a recording afterwards. But really just going through all the final questions that we've got here um, in regards to NDIS registration, what stage are you at? Have you had your first and second audit yet? Since this process is contingent on registration, will you make that information available? Um, Andreas, you are taking care of the audit process. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm working closely with the, with the lawyer on that. So we're at the, uh, at the point of uh, being um, audited. Um, so that uh, we're kind of in that audit process right now. I have to admit the lawyer is kind of more on top of it than I, uh, but I do want to correct that we are only require simple virtual audit because we are only applying for uh, plan management as a category. Um, the audit is kind of the simplest form of an audit you could have uh, from all NDS categories. So in that sense, the timeline is that's also very uh, much simpler. The requirements for policies and procedures is, is also much more uh, yeah, much, much simpler than, you know, where you would kind of would do face-to-face -face care with like participants that have significant needs and so forth. So, um, yeah, so we're at the audit, audit stage right now. Uh, we've talked to the auditors, asked them based on the current timeline, how long it takes. And we're kind of that expecting for the registration to come through in the next two to three months would be my estimate, guesstimate. Um, there is a bit of a black box. Uh, once the audit is handed over to the, um, like once it goes to the NDS itself, it's a little bit of a black box, but because it's the simplest form of an audit, usually that's like two, uh, two to three months that they um, kind of tick the box for the registration. So we're doing everything on our end in terms of tech and organization um, to make sure that we are as ready as possible once we get that provider number to you know, launch our first MVP um, to our first customer base. As we said, we have we have quite a customer base already of, of fa uh, families that have said sign me up to the wait list. So um, co-design is a big part of the heart of Kindship. It's really how I think we've got to where we are. So we'll, we'll be rolling it out to a, a small pool of customers to really work with them to understand how we can make it better and then drip feeding as we go until we're confident that this is something that we can then open up to more people. Um, and then we'll be looking at how we can launch in very um, sort of hyper-local ways so that we can, because so much of the value of clientship lies in that localized data. So except for example, it would make sense for us to drop in Sydney and capture as much of that market as possible, as much of that data as possible, and then expand out um, from there. And fortunately, we have, as you may have seen in our um, documentation, the ex-CEO of Uber Australia. So he bought Uber to Australia. Um, and that was the strategy that Uber very much took. So he's, he's helping to guide that process as well for us. Yeah, fantastic. And um, I, I think that kind of merges perfectly into the next question, which is, are you open to considering sophisticated investors for advisory or board roles for the business in case they can bring relevant industry experience and networks? Yes, so we are open to that. Um, the constitution, which I understand will be available as part of the investor pack, will spell out what that looks like in terms of the shareholding that an institutional investor needs to have to be able to have that um, sort of board level, director level um, influence with kindship. I have to say, I, I've been blown away just not to disregard institutional investors. Yes, we would love to talk to you. Um, but also just speaking to some of the people that have, have expressed interest individually. You know, I was speaking, he might even be on this call. I was speaking to a pediatrician the other day, you know, and we were both talking about how we might be able to work together to understand how to break into the pediatrician sort of 
you know, realm of awareness. So I think that's where we see the opportunity of this crowdfunding campaign is I'm sure many of the people on this call will either have lived experience of raising a child with a disability who are a service provider who may be able to help, you know, give us some level of input into, into the space and, 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 and help from that awareness building perspective. So um, there's, there's a lot of power, I think, in, in us as a shareholding community to be able to make kindship successful. Absolutely, absolutely. And a really quick question. Can you confirm that you will qualify as an ATO early stage innovation company? So ESIC? Yes, uh, that's right, Andreas, right? Uh, yes, yes. I think that's 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 what the lawyers recently, they double checked, asked them to, to double check everything they have, um, made that confirmation, and that should be laid out in the offer document as well. Yeah. Fantastic. And are there, uh, I mean, really, as I kind of go through the questions here, which we've covered, um, in a lot of detail, just the remaining ones left, but there's one here which we haven't really talked about too much, which is, are there any other competitors in this space and how do you compare to them? Yeah, so I think as somebody mentioned in one of their comments, there are, a, um, well, I should say there's there are sort of four big plan management companies that exist, and then there's a large number of smaller, you know, some mum and pop um, plan managers as well. Um, so... We actually, my plan manager is one of the bigger ones and they're based here in Adelaide. Um, we, we've been following obviously their activity for a while. We know that they've got um, a sizable chunk of investment a couple of years ago. And um, and what did you say, Andreas? They, they put that into, well, I, I shouldn't speak for them. Anyway, I think even the, the bigger companies that are out there, they're not tech companies in the way that we have a vision to be a tech disruptor they also as i mentioned don't have that community capacity um, my plan manager actually um, launched a separate company called kenora which was intended to be something like that and then they rolled back a lot of that community layer because i think they realized which we predicted, again, I'm speaking on behalf of them, which I shouldn't, but I, this is my assumption, that um, it's very difficult for a plan manager to become a community. There's that level of trust in where that, the, you know, the, the spirit of the business is coming from. So I think that's where we as a company have so much power is because we spent this last, you know, not, not even just this year, years before that, building up a level of trust with our community and I've really captured that, I'm going to say trust a lot, but um, I'm probably not doing a great job at answering this question. So in terms of where we see our, our unfair advantage, it is the fact that we can leverage that community and a very sophisticated tech suite to be able to, to provide a superior experience is, is my short answer. Yeah. Sorry, everybody for the- I, I would like to, to add something to it. So, um, I mean, there is no Uber in the plan management space. There's no Airbnb in the plan management space, right? Yeah. So while, you know, while there are, let's say, if you look at the leading plan managers and, and the type of um, yeah. revenues that they're making, it's, it's, it's a tiny amount of the total market. So while those amounts are big, it's still a tiny amount of the total market. So in that sense, the industry is ripe for disruption um and and i think we um yeah we, we, we're excited to lead the wave fantastic fantastic well look i think that's all we've got time for and i'm really wanting to just thank everybody for their great questions the kindship team for just this awesome business that you've built and um yeah your questions were just so in depth in in terms of the the level of uh, detail that you provided which i, I think has just been a really great conversation overall. So I wanted to throw over to Kindship to say any final words before I do say to everybody, I will be sending around the recording as well as a link so you can express interest to invest ahead of the investment offer opening next Tuesday, which will just be open to the EOI list. So if you want access to that, please do make sure that you express interest to invest. 
I guess um, Rob and I just like to echo what you said, obviously, in terms of making sure that people express their interest in kindship and to thank everybody for being a part of this webinar. I can't tell you how much as a team your interest in kindship means to us. I think we started this process a little bit like we don't know how this is going to go and we've just been blown away. Um, I think both by the, the interest in terms of what kindship could do as a company, but also what we want to see in terms of the change that we make in the world of, of families living with disabilities. And I think, you know, the idea of having shareholders come on board who treasure both is just what gets us out of bed in the morning. And we, as a, as a team, are really, you know, putting our heart and soul into this project um, and, and would love to welcome those of you who, who can resonate with that and would like to be a part of this journey with us because I just think um, as Andrea as you heard from you know there's so much opportunity for disruption here and I think you saw the stats like these families there is there is so much room to improve like even just quality of life um, and you know these kids a lot of them you know they, they don't get to, to 18 and then suddenly their disability disappears like these kids are going to have lifelong support needs and, and we really want to walk alongside those families for as much of that you know, as they need us to. So that's our ambition. And yeah, I would just love to say we would love, love, love to welcome you as part of that journey. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, look, it's been a real pleasure to do this session with you all and really just want to thank you once again and um, very much so exciting times coming up with the offer opening next week. Thanks everyone. I'll thank you, you all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.